Good morning and welcome back to Unlock the Bible Now. I'm Brother Scott Mitchell. I'm very happy you could join us today. We're going to dive into another message out of God's Word. But before we start, I just wanted to let you know how much we appreciate you. Uh, you, your support, your prayers, your sharing of these videos and using our app helps us know that we're reaching people. And I especially want to point out the comments that we receive. Uh, lots of um, just gratitude is given to to us in your comments about how this ministry is impacting you, both this one and Bible Mysteries podcast. So we want you to know we give all glory to the Lord Jesus Christ for that. It's it, I'm nothing. Uh, and, and in fact, I feel like I'm probably the poorest uh, uh, earthen vessel uh, there is to, to be used for his sake. But God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think and even use somebody like me. So if he can use me, he can certainly use you for some purpose that he has. So we just give him all praise and glory. And before we begin, I invite you to join me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much for mercy, for the Lord Jesus Christ, for your Holy Spirit that seals us. And we thank you that you loved us so much you gave your only begotten Son to die for our sins, that he was raised again for our justification, and we have eternal life through him. We pray that everything we say and do would bring glory and honor to thee and to the Lord Jesus Christ would magnify your love and mercy and hopefully reach somebody out there that needs to hear this truth. We ask it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. Today, I want to talk about why I use the King James Bible. Over the years, I've received questions about which Bible to use or why I use the King James Bible. And there's even many who actually object to using the King James Version, and they cite different objections like it has antiquated language, it's hard to understand, and other things. Now, the subject of manuscript evidence and textual criticism is, is vast and complicated. And today, I'm not going to dive into that. If you want to do a deep dive into these things, you just need to do your due diligence and get in a prayerful careful attitude of studying the scriptures if for you, you want to really come to a better understanding of which Bible, I should say, is the Word of God today. Uh, an excellent book you may want to consider is something called A Tale of Two Cities, and I'm not talking about the one by Charles Dickens or whoever wrote that. Uh, it's a tale of the lineage of manuscripts from two different regions or cities, Byzantium uh, or Antioch, if you want, um, and uh, Alexandria, Egypt. You're you're going to see a contrast in those two lineages of manuscript evidence for the New Testament. And Egypt, unfortunately, was corrupted by Gnostic heresy. So again, that gets into a very complex type of study. I want just to give a brief summary today of why I believe the 1611 King James Bible is the Word of God for us today in English. And I'm going to start in one of my favorite passages about the Word of God, which is found in Psalm 12. So join me in reading Psalm 12, verse 1. And the psalmist writes, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, With our tongue will we prevail, for our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? This is the wicked boasting that they can get away with what they're doing. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted." Now, this is a fascinating passage to me. He begins talking about the ungodly and the way they oppress and hurt the meek and the poor. And seemingly in the middle of a thought, 
he brings up the fact that the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And interestingly enough, modern Bible versions change the phrase, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, which is the words, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever, to the saints. Well, it's true God is going to preserve his saints, absolutely, but that's not the context of this. It's his words. So why would modern versions change that? Well, that's an interesting question. And then he summarizes the whole con- uh, the whole context of this passage, going back to ungodly men, the wicked walk on every side, when the vilest men are exalted. So notice... In this passage about God's word being preserved and pure, it's in connection to man's lies, his vanity, and his deceit. Not only are vile men exalted as leaders, as stars, as whatever, celebrities, but two men in particular are responsible for the edited New Testament text in Greek from which every modern version is translated. These two men are Brooke Westcott and Fenton Hort. I've shortened their names because back then they had like five names. But not only were these two men unbelievers, but they dabbled in theosophy and mariolatry. The vilest men and their vile manuscript has been exalted in modern Bible versions, and you may not know that. This is not my attempt to impugn or uh, make light of your favorite Bible version. This is strictly me explaining to you why I believe the King James Bible is more excellent. Only the King James translation in English is translated from the Textus Receptus, or majority text of the Greek New Testament. Every other version comes from the vile and corrupt manuscript of Westcott and Hort. And I will post a link in the show notes where you can go read them in their own words. It's westcottandhort.com. And you don't have to read books about them if you don't want to. Just read their own quotes of what they believed, and you can make your decision as to whether or not God used these men to aid in making better translations of the King James Bible in English, or of of the English Bible, I should say. One last thing before I leave this. I find it very interesting that God said that the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Why seven? Well, we know seven is the number of completion in the Bible. But you may or may not be aware that the committee that translated the King James Bible, King James had nothing to do with it, He was an amateur theologian, but he was not learned in the scriptures like the men that were gathered by him to do the translation. And they were divided into seven groups of six, 42 men. And there there could have been some changes in that time because somebody may have passed away during the work or whatever. But seven times. And every group of six, when they received a chapter to translate, from all the available manuscript evidence that they had, they would translate it independently and agree, those six, and then that same passage would then go to the next committee of six who independently would translate it and compare. And they did this seven times. I can assure you, text criticism and text translation at the time in 1611 was probably far advanced from what we have today. I don't think it compares. So I'm going to point out seven particular points about the King James Bible that I believe is salient for today. First of all, the King James uses antiquated language. Nobody talks like this. Well, in my opinion, this is actually a bogus argument or complaint. Nobody ever spoke like this. They didn't speak that way in 1611. Not until after the King James Version was published did it have an impact on the world and some people began to adopt that style of speaking, but it was never the language of common discourse. 
It is something called perfect English, translated at a time when the English language had evolved to reach its peak. If the language of 1611 in the style of King James, and we'll get into why it is the way it is later. But if that's accused of being antiquated, well, then why aren't they trying to revise Shakespeare, which adopted a similar form of language? They didn't speak that way either. But that's how theater was presented in in the works of Shakespeare. I don't see anybody pushing to retranslate Shakespeare into modern tongue. And if they did, they would probably have resounding opposition. Why are theologians always referring to the Greek or Hebrew to correct the 1611 King James English? What could be more antiquated than ancient Hebrew or Koine Greek? So it's a bogus argument. It's a false, uh, whatever you call it, red herring, straw man argument. So I, I can dismiss that out of hand. It's It doesn't hold weight. And quite frankly, those that don't want to take the time to understand why the King James English is the way it is, tend to be uninterested in truly studying and delving into the depths of God's Word. And we're going to get into why that's important here in just a little bit. So another point, the second one is, I don't understand the these and the vowels and the word endings like runneth. Well, the original tongues of Hebrew and Greek have devices in them, I guess you could say, tense, gender, number. Uh, These are portions of the language, and it's common in other languages too, but not English. English doesn't have the same kind of tense or gender or number. We don't look at a word and determine whether it's masculine or feminine or neuter. But that's true in Spanish and Italian and other languages. And it was certainly true of Greek and Hebrew. So the 1611 translators introduced a method in English to reflect these functions of the original languages. And it's really quite simple. It's brilliant. People didn't say, how art thou today? Does this, is this thine? Well, they introduced the words thee, thou, thy, and thine, and they are always singular. Thou is you, that one person specifically. Ye, you, and yours is always plural. It's like you all in the South or y'all. It clarifies who is being addressed. The word endings are also more reflective of the original languages, and they have a poetic cadence, which we'll discuss at the end. So runneth and seeketh. You understand the word run and seek. You're not troubled by that, but the endings are something that was intended to be more reflective of the original language and also to bring a balance to the meter and the poetic nature of the King James Bible. And yes, it was translated in such a way that it had a rhythm, like a song. Go with me to Psalm 29. We're going to read verse 4. One simple verse, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Let that thought sink in for just a moment. The creator of heaven and earth. He is majestic. He is powerful. He's not trying to reach down and reach you on your level, a level and bruh, you know, and use a, a common vulgar discourse. God is holy. He is righteous and he is exalted. His word should reflect that. The King James Bible uses majestic language. God's voice is majesty. If his voice is majesty, then his word should be majestic. He's not stooping down to reach us on our level. He's reaching out to lift us up to his glory. And that is the attitude we should have. Not of this Jesus is my friend kind of thing. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of hosts. He's the redeemer, the savior. He's Uh, the King of kings and Lord of lords, you're going to try to bring him down to this, uh, he's my my bro, my friend, my homie. Come on, folks. That's not majestic language. That dishonors the creator of the universe. So I want you to strongly reconsider your attitude towards the Lord in the language that we use. And the King James Bible does use an exalted and majestic language. There are 
Fourth point would be there are many omitted verses in modern versions. Now, it would take hours, in fact, even days, to go over every changed, altered, or omitted verse in modern Bible versions. So I'm just going to give you one or two examples. Because that's enough to get you started. If I show you a couple examples and you go search in your own Bible and compare it with the King James, you're going to see what I see. So keep in mind, we're talking about the New Testament. The King James is translated from the majority text. Of all the extant or existing fragments, pieces, parts, whole volumes or whatever of manuscript of the New Testament, they comprise somewhere around roughly 5,000 manuscripts pieces, parts, whatever. The vast majority of them, some 4,990 something manuscripts, fragments, pieces, parts, all agree with each other and they combine to make up the Textus Receptus or majority text. A handful of other manuscripts disagree where they've changed some things, omitted some things, whatever. They were older than the Texas Receptus. And the reason why is largely they were found in Coptic jars in Egypt or in other places where they were very well preserved. And there's a good reason for that. They weren't used. The early Christian churches in the first few centuries rejected the Gnostic heresies in Codex B and Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and Aleph and all these other manuscripts the four or five or six that actually are older because they didn't want to use them. They used the Textus Receptus, the Byzantine text or the Antioch text, if you want. And they used them so much, just like when you study your Bible and you mark it and you, and you bookmark it and you highlight it and it starts to fall apart. Well, that's the text I want to use, the ones that the church founders and fathers and people actually use. The ones they rejected, very well preserved because they weren't used. Now, as an example of omitted verses, I want you to read a section in Acts chapter 8 for me. This will be familiar to many of you. The Ethiopian eunuch had gone to um, Jerusalem to keep the feast, I believe, of Pentecost. And being a eunuch, he wasn't allowed to go into the synagogue or the temple. So he was hearing word preached about Jesus, but he couldn't get in to get to the heart of the matter. And so Philip was sent by the Lord to go preach to him. And in verse 36, we read, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And basically what's happening is the eunuch is returning to Ethiopia. He's a Jew, by the way. He's not an Ethiopian person. He's a Jew in service to the queen of Ethiopia, Candace. But he um, is riding in his chariot with Philip, and Philip begins to tell him about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou, you, the one person there, Thou, singular, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water and fill up in the eunuch. And he baptized him. Now, that verse, verse 37, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is not found in many modern versions. I encourage you to go check out your Bible and see if it's there. It's either removed altogether or there's it's placed in the margin with a footnote that states that this verse is not found in the best manuscripts. That's very deceptive, folks. The best manuscripts, what they mean is the four manuscripts that were found well-preserved and are older because they were rejected. These are the manuscripts that Westcott and Hort exalted and said, these are the truths that you should be using. And they contain all manner of Gnostic heresies and things like that. They deny the divinity of Christ, the blood atonement, the virgin birth, and numerous other things. So do your diligence. Study it out. 
The King James Bible never fails to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ and his divinity and the virgin birth and the blood atonement. Another thing is John 3.16. This one I think every believer knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Words like begotten, remission, propitiation, they're called old words, but they're vital to understanding God's truth. When these are removed or altered as they are in the modern versions, we lose the intent of God's point. Modern versions say God gave his one and only son. Jesus Christ is not God's one and only son. He is his only begotten son, begotten of the father through a woman, the seed of the woman, Mary. One and only son. There are many sons of God. The angels are called sons of God. Lucifer is a son of God. And that's going to be important in a little bit when we discuss his name. But you think about that when you reduce that word only begotten. Well, people don't say that anymore. Well, they should. Because that's exactly who he is, the only begotten Son of God, born in the flesh. It was removed because the Gnostics didn't think that Jesus Christ was ever physically manifested in the flesh. And therefore, the corrupt manuscript of Westcott and Hort had it removed or changed or altered. There's so many more examples of that. Time would escape me to, to cover them all. Find good books that defend the veracity of the King James Bible and read them if you want to do a deep dive and study. Now, I mentioned Lucifer. Modern versions confuse Lucifer with Christ. Don't believe me? I dare you to check this one out. The word Lucifer is not found in the modern translations. They state it should be properly translated as morning star. Well, there's a major problem with this. Let's read in the King James Bible what it says. Verse 12 of Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now, Isaiah 14 clearly points out Lucifer is an entity who rebelled against the Lord. And yes, he's one of the sons of God. He's one of the angels, one of the fallen angels. He's a cherub, okay? And angels are sometimes called morning stars, such as in Job. But the morning star? So in other words, they're going to say the word shouldn't be Lucifer. It should be translated as Halel, which should be morning star. Well, what about Revelation 22, verse 16? I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. If you have a Bible version that in Isaiah 14 is calling the rebellious entity the morning star, and Jesus is saying in Revelation 22, I am the morning star, you've got a problem. You've got a problem in your Bible. And that was not accidental. That was intentional. Westcott and Hort despised the truth. And that's the reflection you get in your Bible. Then the sixth point is there's a way that the King James Version lets you know when God the Father is speaking about God the Son in the Old Testament before Jesus was even born. Because the words Lord and Lord are used to bring clarity between the Father and the Son. And this is done in the King James Bible. Let me show you. Go to Psalm 2. Now, if you have a King James Bible, you should see this. There may be some other versions that do this too. But I want you to think about this. Look in Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, notice the word Lord there is capital L-O-R-D, all caps, all uppercase letters. Against his anointed, anointed is Mashiach, Christos, Christ, saying, and here's what the heathen and the kings are saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord 
shall have them in derision. And it's capital L, lowercase o-r-d. Who is the one that is going to laugh and have them in derision? Jesus Christ. That's the anointed. Lord in all caps is God the Father. Lord with a capital L, lowercase o-r-d, is God the Son. And it says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. This is Lord Jesus. And vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord, all caps, God the Father, hath said unto me, the Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Begotten. There's that word again. It's consistent with the prophecy of Psalm 2 when we keep begotten in John 3, 16. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. This is God the Father saying to the Son, You ask, Son, and I'll give it to you. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and it's coming. It's coming soon. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord, God Almighty, the Father, with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, God the Son, Jesus Christ, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. This is consistent throughout the entire Bible, not just the Psalms. That is a unique function of majestic language and God making it quite clear who he is and who the Son is. And Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Finally, and my seventh point is, English is declining, as all languages are. And God knew it would. He will ultimately restore a pure language in the earth. I'm going to share one last verse with you in just a moment. But I want you to consider this. From the very beginning, Satan attacked God's word. The serpent said to Eve in the garden, Yea, hath God said, and he altered it. He twisted, and he left things out. That's his tactic. Well, then, if that's what's happening in these other Bible versions, who do you think is behind that? At the Tower of Babel, God confounded the language of the earth. And we now have many languages. But the King James Version points us back to the original language of humanity, which is most likely Hebrew, Because it's majestic, because it's poetic. As a songwriter, I brought this up earlier, but let me explain. There's a cadence to the rhythmic tone of the King James Bible. It was written to be singable so that it can be memorized. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's just one example, but there's many ways that you can read it and it becomes memorable. For I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. For thou art my praise. Everything about that is poetically majestic, and it's on purpose. The Spirit led these men to do that so that you could learn it and memorize it and be lifted up. It's not the pure language of the original world. But I think we're going to return to that. Like I said, it's probably Hebrew. But notice with me in the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord. And by the way, that's Lord all caps. That's God the Father speaking, the Creator. Until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So the context is the wrath of God that's coming because the vilest men are exalted and the vilest versions are exalted today. Why do you think they're pushed so hard? There's a profit motive in them too. The King James Bible has no copyright. They're free. It's in the public domain. But these other Bibles, there's a prophet involved. And the love of money is the root of all evil. The last verse, verse 9, For then will I turn to the people a pure language. 
that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. I'm not saying that there won't be any other languages again when the Lord returns, but when he does come to judge the earth, he's going to return to the people of pure language. He could mean that he's just returning to Israel, the original Hebrew. But I suspect that he's going to return to the world, the language that Adam and Eve spoke, and Abel, and Noah. Up to the time of the Tower of Babel, when he did there confound the languages. So for me, the King James Bible, with its majestic poetic cadence, points us back to that original language, whatever it may be. And hopefully, in the way it looks, it's going to be Hebrew. So take the time to learn and understand the beauty of the King James Bible. It has a meter and a cadence to it that was intentionally designed by the Holy Spirit to teach us and help us memorize. Let's not be lazy. Learn from the majestic Word of God. One final thought. The King James Bible is the Bible of my salvation. I got saved and came to the knowledge that Christ died for my sins through the preaching of the gospel through a King James Bible. I am forever indebted to that, and therefore I magnify the Word of God in the English, in the King James Bible. Other languages have their version of a King James Bible. I don't know those languages, so it's beyond my scope to discuss those things. But God said he would preserve his word perfectly so that all men can find him. And for me, in English, the word of God is the King James. I thank you for listening today, and I hope that something I said to you would encourage you. If you're listening to this message and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would strongly encourage you to do so. And I'm going to tell you verses from a King James Bible that will save you eternally. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised again, according to 1 Corinthians 15. He was raised again for our justification, according to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, according to Romans, chapter 10. If you're a whosoever, you can be saved. Will you trust him right now? Will you believe on him unto life eternal? The promise of God is that he'll save you and he'll save you eternally if you'll trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You personally, you, the one person that I'm speaking to right now that is unsure whether or not you will spend eternity in heaven, you are the thou. You are the one that God would have to be saved or it's his will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Will you trust him? My prayer is that you will. And if you've already trusted him, take the time to sow unto the Spirit and do the research about which Bible version is the Word of God in English. Till next time, be sure to look up for our redemption draws near. Thank you for listening today. If you are enjoying these messages and would like to support us, you can make a tax-deductible donation through our Unlock the Bible Now app, which is free to download from your device's app store, or go to utbnow.com. We appreciate you for giving whatever the Lord lays upon your heart.